social issues, I see some frequent flyers in the room, and I also see some new faces. So if you've never been to Conversation on Social Issues, my name is Kimberly Tate, and I'm one of the reference librarians here at the college. And the library hosts this weekly event because we believe that it is an extension of our charge to promote the freedom of information and open exchange of ideas. And we want to provide a space where everyone can learn from various viewpoints. So whether or not you agree with every single thing you hear in this room, or read in the books on our shelves, or find in our databases, we want you to have the opportunity to learn and grow from those viewpoints. So I have some resources that are up on the board if you're interested in learning more about this topic, um, or if you'd like to find some e-resources, etc. I can help you with that. We love having faculty, staff, and especially students host these sessions. So if you are interested in facilitating a conversation on an issue you feel passionate about, feel free to talk to me after the session or email me. Um, like everyone else's email address, it is my first line, dot last name, so Kimberly.Tate at Seattle Central, SeattleColleges.edu. At the end of the discussion, I'm going to ask you to fill out a brief survey, letting us know what you liked, what you didn't like, how we can improve. We want this to remain relevant and interesting for you. So next week, Jawed Zuari will be discussing the regional and global impacts of the Syrian refugee crisis. I hope you're able to join us for that. But today, Weston Brewer, Program Coordinator for Sales, will be discussing diversity and ableism at Seattle Central College. So let's give him a hand. Weston. Yeah, so my name is Wessel Brewer. I'm a program coordinator at uh, Sales and Mainstay. And uh, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about how our college uh, handles diversity and ableism. And when I was starting this, uh, this presentation, um, I put together kind of a visual map. And then I thought, let me check the website. Let me see exactly on the record where Seattle Central College stands with their mission statement. And a lot of the things that I had lined up directly with some of the, uh, the goals of the college. So, to kick it off, let me, uh, let me describe it, because I learned from one of the audience members that uh, ableism is a word they hadn't heard before. So, just by a show of hands, how many of you guys have heard of the term ableism? Oh, that's, that's amazing. That's great. So, yeah. Uh-oh. There's, there we go. Sorry about that. So ableism. So ableism is kind of a brand new word. It didn't appear until about 2003, 2002. And uh, one of the best definitions that I was able to find was in the Urban Dictionary. I felt that it was revised and had so many people kind of like fine tuning what that definition means that this was the best definition that was able to really boil down what ableism is. And we all have an experience ableism every single day. Um, Ableism is the discrimination or prejudice against people who have disabilities. Ableism can take the form of ideas and assumptions, stereotypes, attitudes and practices, physical barriers in the environment, or larger scale oppression. It is oftentimes unintentional and most people are completely unaware of the impact of their words and actions. So, one great way to kind of distill this is, I used to work with an individual who had Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. And one kind of phrase that he liked to throw around was he said, hey, Weston, you know you're just a tab, right? I was like, tab? What do you mean? He said, yeah, tab, T-A-B. And he said that that means that you're just temporarily able-bodied. So for somebody that was you know, bound to a chair and needed to have assistance with most everything he was doing in life, he really kind of, in one quick sentence, like boiled it down to me of he's absolutely right. Eventually all of us can fall prey to not being as able-bodied as, as other people. And it's just a matter of time before our bodies kind of break down, before we get old, before we all eventually die. So having that explained to me from somebody who was in that position was very, very powerful. Yeah. And diversity, which I think we're all very familiar with diversity. Uh, one of the things I was doing for my research for this presentation was, what is the general consensus of how students at this college kind of feels about the college. So I went to Yelp, I went to Rate My Professor, I went to Pick a Prof, I went to every resource I could find to kind of see like, what is the general vibe at the college? How are students really feeling? What are they proud of at Seattle Central? And one of the things that kept popping up, besides a lot of hate for financial aid department, which <laughs> is totally understandable, but 
at least 20 or 30% of these very, very positive reviews of Seattle Central all spoke about how diversity was one thing that not only did they got to take part in every day in their classrooms and in the cafeteria, but it was just something that was just like, that's rare. That you can go down to our atrium, and when you're grabbing some grub, you, it, it's like the United Nations down there. You can talk to people from all over the world. You can hear languages that you wouldn't hear in most places. So diversity is a huge, important thing for Seattle Central. And one of the things I want you guys to take away from today's presentation is that disability adds to our diversity. We play an active role in, in who our student body is. And people with disabilities add to that rich fabric that make our college so amazing. And that's just something to consider, because I think when people think of diversity, we usually think of, well, I was down in the atrium, and I heard four different African languages. I heard two different types of Chinese. And I got to meet people from all over the world. Well, there's people from right here in Seattle who can add and can kind of uh, make our diversity uh, a little bit different than how we think of it so far. So let me zoom out real quick because, like I said, I found that uh, everything that I wanted to say was kind of directly in line with Seattle Central's core values. By another show of hands, how many of you guys know exactly what those core values are or have taken the time to read the mission statement? All right, very interesting. <laughs> so basically it boils down to being accessible, diverse, responsive, and innovative. And this definitely applies to the student population that I work with every day. So, oh, and that might be a good background. I'm, as a program coordinator of sales, um, it's just a brand new program. We've been around Seattle Central for about a year. <coughs> and it stands for Supported Academics and Independent Life Skills. And I work with students with disabilities to be successful, where I teach a class called College 101 that teaches some basic college skills, and then I do ongoing support for various students. So I have a very unique window into how Seattle Central kind of treats our students and kind of how their impact from other students, other teachers, administration, um, the swell of fear all of my guys get when they go down to the uh, registrar's office and have to wait in line for financial aid. <laughs> and it's really changed how I view the college. It's changed my approach towards diversity. So, yeah. So accessible. This is a huge one. Yeah, you know, are we doing enough to make individuals with disabilities here on our campus feel welcome, feel supported, and most importantly, all well, feel safe? Um, one of the things that I found in my research for this was, and it was a little dated, it, uh, it still had Seattle Central Community College written on the, uh, on the picture, so it kind of shows you that it's been around for a while. But it's basically a, uh, a map that shows all of the handicap accessible entrances to the college. And I think this is something that I had to kind of dig and find online. Like, yeah, this would be great if everybody knew that. If, and I'm sure that over time, that's something that's going to change. We're, as a college, going to really embrace how we view our students with disabilities. Yeah, and diverse. So this picture that I have here was uh, from the Seattle Central website, and it shows the uh, the learning center. Um, yeah. Are we leaving anybody out of this picture? So when a student with a disability is looking at our website and trying to do some research as to what college they want to go to, I feel that like. When they see photos like this, they want to be a part of that group. They want to imagine themselves sitting next to somebody, studying and doing their best. And I feel like with our diversity, the way that it is, we love our international students. And I feel like the international students really have a safety net for when they get here and a structured program that helps them kind of be safe and you know, learn as much as possible. I feel like it's only a matter of time before we take that exact same approach for students with disabilities. They have a very formalized structure to, hey, you're new in our campus and we want you guys to be successful and stay here and learn as much as possible. So I think that's a good question to ask. If we're including everybody, is there anybody that we're leaving out? Is there anybody that we can consider more or kind of, um, yeah, just think about it in a way that we didn't beforehand? Responsive, and 
I love this one, and in my dealings with the instructors here on campus, I feel like they're always, always looking for new, independent ways to, to change how they're doing, to change their approach. And responsive is that they need to reflect and anticipate our community needs, and that the teaching needs to reflect the needs of the students. <coughs> and one of the things is, yeah, another question asked is, can we do more to educate students and teachers about respectful communication? Now, I uh, overheard this story um, in the Disability Support Services office, but uh, a student was sitting in the front row of their class. And I guess the previous week, another student had sat in their exact same spot. Well, when that one student approached the other, saying, hey, would you mind switching places with me? This is where I like to sit. I like to sit in the front row. Uh, the student said, no, um, I need to sit in the front row. Um, I have a disability, and sitting in the front row really helps me kind of uh, pay attention to class, and that's what I need. Well, the other student's question, which was a completely honest question, was, oh, well, what is your disability? And the other student kind of had to be like, you know, I don't know you well enough to share that with you. <laughs> so I feel like that was an honest mistake. I feel like that's something that we all do. And that kind of goes along with ableism. It's that assumption that like, oh, well, you must be lacking or needing something. What is it? I want to wrap my brain around what you have going on so that I can kind of better understand where you're coming from. Well, for the student, that feels like they were put under the gun and that they were put on the spot. And trust me, at least the students that I work with on the autism spectrum, being put on the spot, being kind of having that spotlight shown on you, that's just not going to work. There's going to be some resistance and some friction right out of the gate that really isn't about you know the situation at hand. So how can we, uh, how can we change that? How can we feel, how can we train our students and our instructors to be as respectful as possible? Because it's been my experience of people tend to either kind of react way up here or way down here. It seems to have a very, if you've had no experience talking with and working with an individual with a disability, you either do too much or nothing. That it's easier to kind of like overcompensate and say like, oh, well, clearly you need some help, so let me jump in there and let me really help you. Or, oh, you're vision impaired, let me take you by the arm and march you right across wherever you need to go. Well. That may not be at all what that person wants, but your heart would be in the right place. And so people tend to kind of go in the other direction too, which is, well, I don't know how I can help and I don't know what's happening, so I'm just going to say nothing and just be nothing and just let that person pass and go about my day. So I think that we can make an honest effort to kind of land somewhere here in the middle of what would be a respectful approach. How would I talk to somebody who is in a wheelchair, or somebody who is blind or deaf. Um, rather than kind of panicking and going in the opposite extremes, let's start a dialogue. Let's, let's start teaching our students that asking that person and treating that person the way that they would want to be treated is a better approach than doing what you think you need to do. So, yeah. So I, I feel like we're getting there. I feel like a lot of teachers, when they don't know exactly how to handle a specific student, I feel like it's just a matter of education. And once that information piece is in place, and they can open up that line of dialogue, it really works well. And I've seen a lot of teachers and students grow considerably from a small situation that just kind of got explained and ameliorated because of it. Innovative. Oh, it's something I love about Seattle Central College, is that we're always trying to see what is the next new thing? How can we change for the better? And I pulled this up, and I really like it, because it says, when you want something you've never had, you have to do something you've never done. And that could be a really scary thing. And I think that one of the things that we haven't done yet, that we're really starting to do, is include students with disabilities on a level that we haven't had to before. And I think that, uh, yeah, Seattle Central is a reflection of the student population. And that changing student population means that the instructors the college itself is going to have to roll with that change. So, what are we doing for students with disabilities? And this is sad to say, but you know, I've been working at Seattle Central College for about four years, and I'm still discovering new and interesting ways that teachers are reaching out. 
and I'm still discovering new organizations here on campus that provide uh, excellent student services. So that's one of the things that we can kind of do to kind of make this better is let's start talking. Let's, let's get these different departments and different groups exchanging information about, hey, how can we better communicate with our students with disabilities? So currently, the number one with a bullet would be disability support services. And I don't know if you guys are all familiar with, with Al Suma, but uh, does an amazing job of reaching to as many students as possible, and as well as acting as a resource for teachers. But I don't know if you guys have also heard of Mainstay. Um, quick word, we're going to have an open house for Mainstay, and for sales especially, uh, this coming Monday. And I'll have some flyers available at the end of the talk. Tuesday, sorry. So it's Tuesday the 26th. Um, and sales, the program that, uh, that I work with. Um, brand new. Um, we work one-on-one -on -one with students. And this is going to be... It's going to be interesting to see how many of these students go off and on to, uh, to be successful. I've, I'm going to have some stories at the end of the, uh, the presentation about some of the students that I've worked with that I think will give you guys a very keen insight as to how awesome our school is and how we're doing a lot of things right. And as well as other programs like, like TRIO and our counseling services. But I guarantee you that there's people sitting here at these tables that are like, oh, well, I, I know this other program. Or, I know another teacher that sits in this committee that really helps students out. So that's got to change too. We've got to be swapping notes. We've got to be talking. So yeah, <coughs> one, of, one story that I love that um, really shows about how a teacher can have a responsive reaction to somebody's education was I had a student that was taking a, uh, it was a theater course. And this individual uh, was getting okay grades, but it boiled down to a giant final presentation at the end of this theater course. And he was beside himself with this anxiety. And easy to understand. Um, I'm nervous, and I've talked to lots of groups before, and I like doing presentations like this. And I'm still sweating, and I'm still a little anxious. But my student, was terrified. He <coughs> was scared just to go to class, just to have somebody talk to him about this presentation they were going to have to give. He put a lot of effort into this presentation. He'd been working on this presentation pretty much since he saw it on the syllabus. So we had a meeting with the teacher. He was able to practice the presentation with the teacher. And then after discussing with the teacher, it was like, you know what? He delivered the presentation to me. So if that's the presentation that he was going to give, I'm going to go ahead and grade this presentation that he gave to me just now. I watched my student like a waterfall of just stress relief just wash over him of, oh my gosh. Because before this, he had actually had to go get a doctor's exam because his heart was hurting. Because he was so racked with this intense anxiety that I, I could barely begin to understand how he felt. But to watch when that pressure, and it wasn't even the, the public speaking aid, because that's where I think we all were on the same page. We weren't. It was that grade. As soon as he learned that that grade had already happened, and that he had already put all this work into it, the next day he still delivered the presentation to a group of about 100 people. Everybody was bringing their family. It was over in the, uh, the big theater, over in the fine arts building. It was incredible. Without that stress, he was just kind of like skipping around on stage and just happy as could be. And it was an amazing presentation. He was very proud of himself. But the thing was, is that once that pressure was gone, once that, that trigger of, oh my gosh, this anxiety that had been building clearly for an entire quarter, once that was gone, he was a new student. And it was just impressive to watch how once that pressure is gone, about how, that, how that learning can take place. But that's an interesting thing, because I believe that it's a bell curve. I believe that you have to have just enough pressure to do well. To learn, there has to be some discomfort. And I want you guys to do something with me here. So I think we're all familiar, and I want everybody to do this, if they're able to. Um, cross their fingers together like this. And how does that feel? It feels pretty natural. At some point in a given day, you'll 
cross your fingers and just kind of let them rest together. Well, I want you guys to take the top finger and just slowly switch place with the finger underneath it. And then once you get to the bottom, try to do it all the way back to the top. It feels gross, doesn't it? It feels weird. Your body is doing something it doesn't normally do. And that new learning experience, something that you don't do on a regular basis, feels uncomfortable. <coughs> so it has to be somewhere between this is new and this is scary. Because I really feel that learning happens right here in the middle, where you're a little uncomfortable, but you're not so uncomfortable that you're distracted and that you have these all these synapses are firing, all this stimulus is happening. It's, it's got to be in there somewhere to where, okay, I have to move past that because it's new. And anything that's new is going to feel a little uncomfortable at first. All right. Leader of the pack. So this is another story about a, uh, an individual. She went to college at some point at a different college struggled with it, tried her best, and her best really was about a C, maybe a C plus if she was lucky. Every group work that she'd ever been in, she was always the one late with the work. She was always the one trying to play catch up, trying to keep up with the rest of the group that she was in. So her entire life, this experience had really shaped her image of herself. She really had settled into this, well, of course I'm a C student. I always get C's, and every group that I'm in, I'm always you know, the last one trying my best to just keep up with everybody else. Well, in the sales program, she was a sharp cookie. Maybe grade-wise, she wasn't as sharp as some of the other students, but she knew the bus system, she worked part-time, and she had a lot in savings, and was very much her own woman. That made her top of my class. She was a shining example of what to do with the other students. And for the first time in her life, she was the leader. She was somebody that the rest of these guys looked up to as a great example of, oh my gosh, what she has, I want. That transformed this young woman. She went from being a C minus, C plus student to low A's, high B's, somebody the teachers love to have in their class, somebody who went that extra mile and really put in the work. And I really think it was just when that shift happened, when she went from being the student that was always at the bottom trying to look up to somebody that actually had some experiences that her peers could be jealous of. This made her a leader. And that, to me, like is the reason why she saw it all the way to the end and has graduated with her uh, AAS degree from Central. So yeah, dragging while walking. This, uh, this one happened just recently. Uh, one student that I had went to their normally scheduled class, and when they got there, the classroom number had changed. They had moved classes to a different location. You know those, uh, those yellow sheets that they put in the doors to kind of say, hey, we're not meeting in 1207, we're meeting in 1309. Well, that sheet, the top piece of tape had worn off, and it just folded right over. So he was staring at the roadmap to get to where he needed to go, and didn't have any clue, and was looking at all of his classmates, and looking at all these different people, and you can do this too, and when you're in the hallway, just stop for a second, and then just let everybody walk past you. One thing that you'll notice is that everybody kind of seems like they know exactly where they're going that you're kind of in the way, they're going to the library, they're going to the cafeteria, they're going to class. So I can only try to imagine the amount of panic that my student had. And it wasn't like they had to give a presentation, it wasn't like they had a test that day, it was just a normal class day. But he went from, oh my gosh, it's hard enough just to be in class. I hate fluorescent lights, I hate crowds, I don't like being around strangers. Um, I gotta take this teacher's dumb class, and now she won't even tell me where it is? Oh my god! So this student had wandered around for far too long with, hoping for a glimmer of a clue as to where they were going. And the thing is, I don't know if you've ever been over on the fourth floor, but the numbers kind of play a, a fun game with you. So even if you kind of had a right, like, oh my gosh, okay, I'm going to head towards this number, I think it might be over here. Wait, no, 
and they had to loop around at least six times before he eventually came and found our office over at sales and had a little bit of assistance. Well, A, I think that the way our campus is designed is more on luck and kind of like, oh, we'll put a room here and we'll call it this. Cool, that's great. And I gotta imagine that, you know, that could be a lot easier. And for somebody who doesn't quite have the, 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 the toolkit to get that assistance, it's like, I had to imagine he felt like he was drowning and just did not know how to shout for a life preserver. Because I think the rest of us, oh, well, I'm headed to this class and I don't know where it's at, so I'll go to the information office, they'll type it up or they'll ask somebody and I'll figure it out. Well, this student did not have the tools to just say, hey, help me, but was clearly looking panicked. So I got to think that one of the things that maybe we can change about our college is train our students to look for that panic expression. You know, we need to be helping our students help other students. So when we did eventually find it, and we went and started at the very beginning, and that's when I found out that the tape had folded over, but such a tiny thing had become a huge nightmare escape for, my client, you know, for, my, for the student. So it's just one of those things to consider of, oh my gosh, ableism. I can easily find my classes. I can talk to somebody that can help me out. But not everybody has that power. Um, one of the things, um, when I was, uh, I stayed in Dallas. I stayed at this, uh, this Buddhist center for a few days. And one of the things that the Lama there had said that it really touched me was, anytime you encounter a problem, why not try compassion first? Start there and work your way around it. Even if you're way off base, even if that doesn't help the situation, you're going to be on the right track. And I think that mentality, helping our students help other students, that kind of shift, that's happening. I feel like our college is getting more aware of what it's like to be a student from another country, a student with a disability, a student that needs to have every opportunity made accessible to them. And I feel like we're getting there. I feel like our core values really reflect this shift that's happening now. <coughs> um, yes, I would like to invite everybody Tuesday. Right. I was right, it's Monday. Yeah, I got the flyers here. Um, we're going to have a, an open house for our sales program to kind of explain a little bit more about what we do, about our, the type of student population that we work with, and some really amazing stories and uh, kind of successes that have, I think are slowly shaping our college in the right direction. And I would love to take any questions that you guys have. I always, I always hate talking at crowds. I always like talking with crowds. So does anybody have any experiences they'd like to share or any kind of uh, input that uh, be appropriate for this? Don't be shy. Any questions at all? Yes? I was wondering what the difference is between what the main sale or mainstream and sales. Oh, mainstay and sales? So mainstay <coughs> helps find um, employment for adults with disabilities and sales works with Seattle Central students. Sometimes those two worlds kind of dovetail into each other. Uh, for example, we have a student here on campus that now works for the biology department. So it's kind of like they began with their sales program, and they got that mainstay employment coaching experience from that other side of the same program. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Ah, yes. We are over in the North Plaza. Very easy to miss building, but it does exist. It's right next to the sand building. Now he knows what I'm talking about. Um, and yeah, but Mainstay has been a part of the college for over three decades, helping adults with disabilities. Sales is part of Mainstay. And sales, yes, sales is a part of Mainstay. But sales have kind of grown from this past year from Mainstay, and it's like, hey, we've been a part of the college, we work with this population, we love our college, we need to be working with students and helping students with disabilities. And we've been working in conjunction with Disability Support Services, and it's been a beautiful thing. Yes? Can you give us some statistics on the enrollment of uh, ableism, diversity, et cetera, including the Alice program? Oh, I would, uh, I would be very fascinated to, to figure that out. That's not something that I had with me for this presentation. Okay. Okay. But I feel like there's so little information. There's very little numbers attached to, yes. 
So I do know that uh, Disability Support Services uh, does track the number of students that they work with, which, yeah, that is that is really good. I would love to see that information. <coughs> Alex, uh, yeah. Are you asking uh, numbers? Yes, please. Okay, so with uh, my office, Disability Support Services, we have 400 students with disabilities. That includes uh, learning disabilities, ADHD, several palsy, cancer, paraplegia, uh, quadriplegia, uh, mental health issues, a large number of mental health issues. That category is divided into like 15 different subcategories. So yeah, 400 students that we have. And yeah. sales has, I don't know. Gosh, well we have way less than that. We, we work with about currently about 11 students with disabilities. So. For the Disability Support Services Office, they do as much as they can for as many students as they can. And we are very fortunate to work with a very small number of students because we not only do we get a lot of extra time with those students, I mean, we, we work for years with those students. Um, yes? So this is our Director of Sales and Mainstay, Allison McCormick. I was just going to say maybe it would be helpful to talk about, you know, the difference between the level for accommodation and the work Yeah, so, so yeah, so that's one thing. How many of you uh, know what an accommodation is? Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So an accommodation is a reasonable request made that doesn't change the curriculum, it doesn't change the expectations, but just changes a little bit of the approach as to how that student can best adapt. Um, sometimes it's as simple as uh, a different height of chair or is uh, needing a, a note taker in class. So it's kind of, it's flexible to the student's needs, but it has to be a reasonable request on the teacher's part. And accommodations are made as a part of 504 in the college setting, and accommodations are made in the workplace. With, with Al, um, with some of our students that kind of overlap because we have students that we work with that are also part of Disability Support Services. So they get the accommodations they need from the college through Al, through Disability Support Services. But as far as the, what we do with the students is kind of help with the, uh, the planning and kind of help with direct one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And uh, so we kind of figure out, okay, what is this student getting and what else do they need? Are they getting everything that they need from disability support services? And whatever they're not getting, let's help them find out how to get that. So, okay, go ahead, Let, let me add a little bit to that, perhaps give you context for this too, is it okay? Yeah, oh, absolutely. So, historically, um, since Seattle Central opened its doors in 1968, 60, 67, 66, all that, uh, we've served students with a variety of disabilities. And over the years, as the disability movement has progressed, and those in the movement have said, you know, we want more access and more access, it's also now moving in the direction of those individuals with severe disabilities. So parents now have children who go off to college with different abilities and, and disabilities, but parents have put a lot of pressure on the government to start saying, now we want, us, we want our sons and daughters to get services too, who maybe have um, more in-depth and involved disabilities, serious disabilities yeah. that traditionally would not ever have been served in a college setting. Mm -hmm. So now, this is where the sales program is taking some of those students who historically would not have been served, they would have been said, well, you don't meet the criteria for, for an admission for college. You need a lot of support, a tremendous amount of support more support than a disability office like mine would, so would, would, would provide. So now sales came along and said, hey, we want to fill this gap 
and we want to respond to the pressure of parents who want their um, students, other children, uh, sons and daughters, in a college setting. So now you do one-on-one, -on -one, yeah. well, they do one-on-one -on -one support with students. Mm -hmm. um, that's intense. Something with 400 students I could never do, but with one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you have 11 students, you said? Yeah. Students? yeah, yeah, 11 students. They can provide that. They're in a better position. So in context, what I'm saying is historically, things are shifting now. Those individuals with intellectual disabilities who would never be seen in the classroom before under any circumstances, and now there are grants out there that the government's giving to colleges and universities across the country, and I'm a reader for those grants, and so I see these things, who are saying, we want our severely um, involved student, son with a disability in college. And that's where the sales is coming. So for example, like, they have to pass the, uh, the Compass exam. They have to test into getting into you know, Sales Central College. Well, with the College 101, we tackle test anxiety first, and then time management. So then, then we kind of established a routine to study and prepare for the Compass exam. And so that when time came for them to pass it, they did extremely well. And that same approach is taken to their classes of how can we best change your schedule and change your habits and change your routine to adapt to the needs of that class. And just like Alex explained, like we have the, we're fortunate enough to be able to spend a lengthy amount of time with our students to really have these positive changes to. Yes. So then is it grant driven that the program only helps students with developmental disabilities or most likely on the autism spectrum disorder? So when the program began, it started out as private pay. Mm -hmm. And then now we've had an amazing relationship with the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation mm -hmm. to help kind of offset a lot of those costs. So, and that's been an amazing thing. I've seen some students that have been waiting for the opportunity to go to college and be successful. Have been at home playing video games, wearing pajamas, eating cereal in the afternoon, just hoping that their dream of dreams would come true, that they would be able to be a part of what we kind of take for granted. Anybody else? Uh, any more clarification or anything else that I can? I, I would love to talk to you after the presentation too. I would love to. One yeah. Last thing. Mm -hmm. Are there any? Oh, well, they have to be able to handle the material at Seattle Central College. So when somebody tests so low into their compass scores, <coughs> they're not going to be able to keep up with the curriculum. Then unfortunately, we've, we have had to say no to some people. Yes. Good question. Oh, yes. Uh, I was wondering what you thought, uh, how you think Seattle Central as a community can better support, communicate, and have like, positive dialogue with differently able persons and persons of like backgrounds? Yeah, I, I feel like the different uh, <coughs> clubs and organizations here on campus, like this has been Transition Week, and I have seen mm -hmm. an amazing conversation happen between my students and various club organizations. <coughs> and I've seen students talking with their teachers and being there to kind of be like, hey, you have to go and talk to Miss So-and-so. It's Tuesday, we made that appointment. So helping to kind of facilitate that conversation, but it's, it's talking about it. It's, it's <coughs> rather than just ignoring it or kind of thinking like, oh, well, I'm sure some people do their best and really help, but I, I do what I do. I think that just that conversation is happening. And I feel like that communication is really how things are going to change. And I feel like that's, that's what's happening. That's what I'm seeing a lot of, are people are talking about it. <coughs> Heck, I'm, I'm here now talking to you guys. That's a great example of where that conversation gets started. Anybody else? Oh, yes, Anna. Um, so you drew the line on the board about how people will do nothing around disabilities and how on the other end they do too much. They'll do everything for them because they think they can't handle it themselves. And on November 4th at 12 o'clock, there will be a seminar in 1110 about how to act around people with disabilities, when to help not, um, and there will be sort of a primary focus on people with visual impairments, where you can wear simulators and kind of feel like how it would be to be visually impaired, and how to ask people if they need help, and how to help them. So that is November 4th at 12 o'clock. That's going to be an amazing presentation. <coughs> so our open house, their presentation, 
Um, Al, uh, you, you, you and Anna, like you guys teach a class, right? I, I forget the exact name of it in the moment, but. Introduction to Disability Studies. Yes. So it's happening. This change, this positive change, is getting away from ableism and really focusing on diversity. It's happening. Slowly, but it's, it's going to happen. I might want to add just one point to the person in the back. Who, how do we um, uh, have more dialogue and communication? I think it's really important for those individuals in the disability community to have a voice. And here on campus, we don't have a, uh, a club, a disability club. Because I think there are people who may be fearful of joining such a club because of stereotypes and stigma, perhaps. The time to change and the movement's really moving quickly here and, and everyone has a place at the table these days. So I would say that one of the places we could begin with is the students themselves with disabilities to, to, uh, to use their voice and to <coughs> find a place at the table. And one way maybe through a club and then things expand from there. That's just one time. I'm sorry. No, that's, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. I was going to say, when you were talking about people with disabilities, I am one of those people who has an invisible disability. Yeah. And I can't not walk down the stairs because of some of my medical problems. For the time I've been in college, it went from a lot of times not being able to get on the elevator at all because people will not just totally will not get off the elevator even after you tell them yeah. to the point where you're staying now. So they want to know what's your disability before they are even going to yeah. consider moving. <clears throat> but it is getting better. I mean, I've been at school for three years now, and like I said, three years ago, they wouldn't move at all. Uh, I don't care what I said, they were not getting off the elevator. They had to spawn the elevator, and that was it. <clears throat> and now it's different. And people are listening a little more, and people are willing to do a lot more. So it's getting better. And as far as what Al was saying about the club and stuff, you know, one of the things I've seen that does help a lot is not necessarily a club, but an advisory council that we can compromise, composed of both students and staff and faculty. Because if we don't bring the information up to the administration level, the things that need to change at that level will not happen. And without that, you know, nothing's going to change the school. The, Student leadership has the Accessibility Committee, and that has been a, a major lifesaver and a life changer, as far as I can see. And you don't have to have a, dis a, a disability that prohibits your access to join that committee. All you want to do is want to see some change. So if you're looking for something to do that's helping change people's lives, that's one place to check. And I'm, that's specifically to the students in the room. That is one thing that you can put your voice behind, you can put your energy behind, and, and change things for all people. Because right now, getting to the, to the cafeteria can be a major yes. challenge for people yes. that, can, that have problem walking, or making their way up and down stairs, or stuff like that. The well, only way the cafeteria is, tables, too, are to well, I'm saying, set it Just to get to the cafeteria to even buy your food is a major undertaking for a lot of us. You have to go all the way over to the ramp, get behind the op gallery sit program, be through the area for yeah, all the for way culinary, around. The all the way around. And it's a major block. <coughs> I mean, sometimes true. you have to make a choice. Am I going to bring a sandwich from home because I can't get to the cafeteria? That's true. And the reason for that, of course, is just for your information, is that the school was built in the 60s. Yeah, yeah, I know. But yeah. yeah. And so um, we didn't think about, they didn't think about accessibility issues yeah. and pathways and things right. like that. Right. And one other thing, too, about you talk about the elevator. It's interesting to me how a lot of people don't know the etiquette, yeah. etiquette associated with elevators yeah. and wheelchair yeah. individuals. They yeah. just don't know the etiquette. And so uh, the etiquette is just announced out loud right here is that if someone is trying to get on the elevator with the wheelchair and it's full, you would leave the elevator, right? To make room. But I find that on buses too, I take the buses all the time. I find that people don't know to, to sit down, to get up when someone, either in a wheelchair or an elderly person or a pregnant person or something like that, um, comes on. So it's, we have to teach people etiquette, yeah. I find that uh, these days. You know, as far as the elevators, my problem is going down the stairs, not up the stairs. 
And when I'm on the fourth floor or the fifth floor and I gotta go down, going down once, even one floor at a time is a major undertaking. I, I've tried that. I was on the fifth floor and I tried going down the stairs and it took me almost a half an hour just to get from the fifth floor to the first floor, walking down the stair. Right. Yeah. And if I'm standing in front of the elevator and I say, hey folks, I need to get on the elevator, I have a disability, that should be enough to, to, for yeah. someone to at least try to make some room on the elevator. And it's not happening as much as it should. So, I mean, I mean, I got frustrated enough times that I would pull out my disabled parking permit out of my bag and say, do, do you need proof? Here you go. Yeah. I need to use the elevator. And that's really kind of a bad thing. It's, no one should get to the point where they're red in the face and veins popping out of their head just yeah. to be able to use the elevator. And the school has done so many things already to change that. I mean, the new bathrooms on the first floor and stuff like that are a major. I think that we could change all this. take steps to kind of combat yeah. that exact attitude. I feel like that there's no problem that we can't solve with more communication and educating people and compassion. And compassion, absolutely. Yes. Question over here. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah, uh, various uh, multicultural uh, clubs. Yeah. And uh, I would like to know as a journalist major because I started working on a project how to um, blow how uh, international students react to breaking news and how they feel in, how they integrate themselves here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So I would like to know if the school helps those uh, in multicultural clubs if they like you are working with them on the project. Mm -hmm. For instance, like um, Vietnamese club is what is uh, currently organizing and preparing uh, Teachers Day. Mm -hmm. On the 26th November, so I would like to know if you are, like you know about that. And if that would be great. Yeah, I would love to, to know some more information. That's so that's one thing that I always want. So the yeah. college needs to be talking to the college. We need to be swapping notes. We need to be sharing our resources and our information with each other. Absolutely. I mean, we can only benefit from that. So yeah, I, I would love to learn more about yeah, that. I'm working like in the school, like work with. Uh, those like throughout clubs or you know, on projects. So does the school work with multiple Yeah, people? yeah, I mean, do you have them? Do you collaborate with them on projects? Um, not yet, but I would love to. That sounds, that sounds really interesting. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? I don't want to leave anybody up. Thank you all so much for the opportunity. Um, I want you all to take flyers uh, for our open house. Thank you all. Thank you so much for attending.